Why, hello there. Brent here with Bring Your Own Tools. On today's episode, if you want to see how we completely transform this sad kitchen from this to this, keep on watching. Let it start in. Thank you, Georgia Boot, for sponsoring this week's video. Stay tuned until the end to figure out how you can get 20% off site-wide. For this magnificent kitchen makeover, it all starts here. And this isn't the worst dated kitchen I've personally seen, but it definitely is in need of an upgrade. The first step of this process is personally my favorite, the demo day. Most of these cabinets are secured to the wall with just a handful of screws, which makes it extremely easy to remove, as well as making sure you have a helping hand to make this process go even faster. These kitchen cabinets are quickly and easily removed, and as you get to the appliances, the one thing you have to be careful of is to make sure everything is disconnected properly before trying to remove it. That includes all the hoses and electrical that goes to the dishwasher, the sink, and of course, our range especially in this case since we're working with a gas range. As for tools, a drill and a sledgehammer will take care of the vast majority, but it's always nice to have a reciprocating saw on hand to cut piping and countertops to size as needed. And yes, in this instance, I will say luckily we have laminate countertops because it makes it extremely easy to remove, as you can see. After the countertops were removed, the base cabinets are only installed with two screws because they're only fastening at stud locations. And as a side note, for any demolition project, you should know exactly where your emergency water shutoff valve is. You never know what's going to happen, and hopefully you never have to use it, but if you do have to use it, you want to know exactly where it is. This kitchen cabinet was stuck in there really well for some reason, which is why I picked up this Viking arm jack, which made it a lot easier to remove, and it turns out it was stuck on a floor vent for some reason that was right underneath our sink. On this project, we had a small kitchen pantry that was actually more of an eyesore and didn't flow with the space. Therefore, we're going to be removing the kitchen pantry and actually installing a large upper cabinet next to the fridge in order to accommodate the space that we're losing here. The flow of the space is important because we're trying to make room for a growing family. I pre-cut the drywall to make it easier to remove in large chunks and then take the reciprocating saw to our framework. But remember, the most important thing is to make sure that you're not cutting into load-bearing walls, which we did check ahead of time. And this was not a structurally necessary wall, which is why we were easily able to remove it. For a sizable demolition project like this, I do suggest renting a dumpster. You're easily able to rent this for a few hundred bucks and it saves a tremendous amount of time, especially if you consider multiple trips to the dump in my little truck. I do love my truck, but it is little. We're removing all of the tile on this project and for that we need some heavy duty equipment, which is why we picked up one of these. This is a demolition hammer and it's basically a mini jackhammer which can get into really tight knit areas as well as completely remove old tile very quickly with a bit like this. Makes it a lot easier, you can rent these, but I picked this one up for a couple hundred bucks and it's worth its weight in gold since I do a lot of demolition. And as you can see firsthand, this really does remove tile extremely quickly and efficiently. It's a huge time saver on a project like this and all I have to do is get that bit underneath the tile and it does the work for me. It's also a manageable size and you can get it into small tight knit areas like a small hallway. This is also another good reason why you have a dumpster on hand because all I have to do is load it into a couple buckets and throw it in. As we make our way to the bathroom, we do have a small caveat because we do want to keep the tile in the bathroom and not have to replace all of that flooring, which is why I'm taking my grinder with a diamond wheel and removing all the grout from that doorway. Luckily for us, that grout line was perfectly in line with the door itself and therefore it's a perfect stopping point for our tile. I remove the grout first before I remove the tile adjacent to the ones that we're keeping because it's much more manageable doing it this way and avoiding the tiles that we don't want to damage. Speaking of things that we don't want to damage, this is the tile that's right next to our sliding glass door and we obviously don't want to damage those which is why I placed a large piece of rigid insulation right next to it. If there's any mishaps, it's going to hit the rigid foam and not our glass door. 
After we clean up all the tile and place it in the dumpster, it's now time to get to the subfloor. The original tile was installed properly on a quarter inch cement backer board, but the problem is, is that we're installing engineered hardwood flooring, which doesn't require a backer board. Therefore, we have to remove all of this backer board, and unfortunately for us, they installed this backer board extremely well. Which means every 3 by 5 foot sheet has approximately 30 to 40 screws in it, which I do have to remove the thin set out of the head of each screw and then remove the screw. That takes some time and energy as well as the fact that they put some thin set underneath the backer board, which isn't desired normally because it's brittle and therefore you should be applying a subfloor adhesive which actually stretches. But in this case, it's thin set, makes it more difficult to remove, and hopefully you don't have to deal with this on your project, but on mine, it was the case. This backer board removal and cleanup literally took me over six hours to do, so I won't bore you for the whole process, but just know this is a time consuming effort, but it is vital for this entire project because we are going to be replacing all the flooring in this downstairs area, not just the kitchen. A large crowbar and sledgehammer were my preferred tools, but if you have any suggestions on how to get it out even faster, please let me know in the comment section because I am interested to know if there's any better alternatives than what I did. As we get closer to the bathroom, I do take my angle grinder and grind a seam into the cement board right underneath our tile. I have my shop vac turned on to try and suck up as much of the dust as possible because you do not want to be breathing this stuff in either. In order to get into these tight knit corners, I do take my multi-tool to cut the cement board in these locations, and with the crowbar and my trusty sledge, I was able to remove the cement board without a single piece of tile cracking in the bathroom. The previous cabinet installers installed a half inch piece of particle board underneath all the cabinetry, which luckily for us was only down with a few nails, which made this final step of our demolition process very nice to go out on because it was the easiest part to do. I do one final cleanup and sweep of this entire space, and once we have that taken care of, we can now finally move on to cabinets. Before the demolition process even started, we went into detail as to finding a good quality cabinet manufacturer locally, as well as making sure that we had proper renders made up, and of course some architectural drawings. But once all that was agreed upon, we ordered the cabinets, made sure they showed up at the correct time right after demolition, and now we can get to installing. I first went around the room to determine exactly where our stud placements were located and then brought in our cabinets. I didn't bring all of them in at once, just the uppers and a couple of the base cabinets to start off, but that's plenty in order to get this ball rolling in the right direction. Now these are our cabinets, specifically our upper cabinets, and the nice thing about these cabinets is that they have a plywood core, so they're much sturdier than a particle board. Now that we have all of our uppers accounted for, I need to figure out the actual layout of the space. As far as the upper cabinets, they are 40 inches tall, but we do have to add two inches for crown molding. And now that we have that specific layout, we can determine the rest of the cabinets all the way across the kitchen with a laser level, my favorite. A laser level comes in extremely handy in numerous instances on this project, which you'll see shortly. The first way we're using it is to determine exactly where our high spot is on the floor. As I go around, the lowest number on my tape measure is gonna actually be the high spot for our floor measurement. I can then use the same laser level setup for my uppers and determine where my low spot is in the ceiling. You want to make sure this is accounted for before you start installing cabinets because we're going to be installing crown molding and if all of a sudden there's a ceiling variant change that you didn't account for, it might screw up your trim at the very end of this project. This corner is the low spot for our uppers, which is why I'm measuring at this point at 41 and 3 quarter inch. I then place my laser level on that line and that way I'm able to pinpoint exactly where I want the base of our upper cabinets placed. In order to make this install as easy as possible, I place a 2x4 at the very bottom of this laser line and make sure it's level and fasten it in place. I can also stretch this 2x4 onto the adjacent wall because I know all these cabinets need to line up accordingly. It's now finally time to install our very first cabinet, and it's this corner cabinet that we place first because this affects both sides of our cabinetry. 
I make sure the cabinet is properly level and if there needs to be slight adjustments, you can always use a shim at the very bottom. Once it's level, I then drill two inch long cabinet screws on both the top and bottom portion of the cabinet and that thing is fully secured and not going anywhere. We place our second cabinet right adjacent to our first cabinet and I actually use these cabinet clamps that are specifically designed to make it easy to line up the faces of our cabinetry. This way the sides and the face all line up appropriately which makes for quick and accurate fastening whether it's fastening to the wall or from cabinet to cabinet. As you can see right here, just make sure you're not using too long of screws and you pre-drill your holes first. I scoot in our corner base cabinet to the appropriate location and I align my laser level with the edge of my base cabinet, which then provides me with the exact measurement needed in order for the upper cabinet to match up with the lower cabinet. And this is where our cabinet filler is coming into play. Any good cabinet shop should provide the fillers for you and by running it through the table saw provides me a really nice crisp line all the way down at the correct depth. I then secure this filler piece on the side of the cabinet with a couple clamps, pre-drill my holes, and fasten it in place with a couple cabinet screws. Once our filler is properly attached, I then bring the cabinet over to our other cabinets that are installed and butt our filler up against the first cabinet that we installed. I clamp both cabinets together to guarantee proper alignment, and once that's taken care of, we can then fasten the cabinet into the wall, as well as on the back side of our filler, which guarantees that these cabinets won't be coming apart anytime soon. The next cabinet that we'll be installing is our 30 inch cabinet that's right above our oven, which is also right above our microwave. This is why we have electrical coming out of the wall, which we do have to account for and pre-drill a hole so we can accommodate the electrical wire through the cabinet and then place an outlet in the cabinet. You can definitely get all these units installed by yourself, but it does help greatly if you have a second hand on site to make sure that you can lift these cabinets and place them with ease. They're not that heavy, but they can be cumbersome if you're the only one trying to manage this alignment. I obviously couldn't rest this cabinet on the 2x4, which is why I just lined up the very top of the cabinet with the adjacent cabinet, and that obviously works out perfectly with our last cabinet that we place at the very end of this run. Now that we have this row of uppers taken care of, I then bring in a secondary base cabinet to make sure our 30 inch space needed for our range is accommodated. I then double check just to make sure that our upper cabinets align properly with our base cabinets and as long as they are, you might as well outline exactly where those base cabinets are located and start cutting some plywood. We're using half inch plywood and we're placing this at the very base of each base cabinet. We do this for a number of reasons and number one of course is to make sure that we can guarantee we have a structurally sound surface that is perfectly flat. Not always the case in every single kitchen remodel. But on this kitchen, we do have a proper subfloor, so we're not too worried about the flatness. However, we do want to make sure we have proper height, which more accounts for your countertop height, because if you didn't have this and you just installed your kitchen cabinets and then ran your flooring to it, you'd actually be losing height of your cabinets by at least a half inch. This way, we're rest assured to have the appropriate height of our cabinets once our flooring is in, because we've already accounted for that variant. I measure and cut all of our plywood with a standard circular saw and use inch and a quarter construction screws that have a flat head on them to make sure that each panel is fully fastened. Tracing the outline of our cabinets made it really easy to pinpoint exactly where I needed the plywood and once our plywood base is installed, I then bring in our first base cabinet to secure in place. Now this base cabinet is the corner cabinet and is actually quite important. Everything works off of this and to make sure that it aligns properly with the upper cabin above is extremely important because it's right next to our oven. I level out the base cabinet and quickly realize that some of these walls are not perfectly straight, which is why I do have to shim out the back side in some locations, but it's nothing that a couple shims can't take care of. As I noted earlier, we do have this oddly positioned vent right underneath our sink, which we do have to work around, but it's not a big deal. Just make sure you're running the plywood at the same depth as the rest of the wall. I add up the width of the next three base cabinets that are going to be installed as well as a standard 24 inches needed for our dishwasher and that gives us a 93 inch mark which I then make sure we run our plywood to. 
I place the next base cabinet right up against our corner cabinet and then check for levelness. Now I obviously know I need to put a few shims at the very front because we do have quite a slope in the front angle and a slight adjustment might be needed here and there until we get perfect level on both sides. Once the level is good, I position a few shims on the back side and secure it nicely with a few cabinet screws. These are the same two inch long cabinet screws that I installed for the uppers, and after it's secured on the back side, I then place a few shims between the cabinets and secure the cabinets tightly together. But just remember to use the proper length screws so you're not screwing through both cabinets. The next cabinet we'll be installing is our large sink cabinet that rests right in between our window as well as has a large opening on the back side to accommodate all the plumbing. Once level with a few shims, I secure it to the wall, then the cabinet next to it, and I would attach a few extra screws on the front rail of each cabinet in order to minimize the seam that's actually seen in the front of the cabinet. I account for a 24 inch wide span between the next two cabinets and as I'm placing the final cabinet in this row, I do realize I need an extra shim on the back side here because the floor may be flat but it's not level. And we definitely need a level span from cabinet to cabinet in order to guarantee we have a perfect transition for our countertops. Once this base cabinet is secure, I bring over the upper and make sure the side of this cabinet lines up with the side of our base cabinet. But if you're wondering, I do have that laser level up there for a reason, and it's because it's indicating exactly where my stud location is, so I know for certain I'll be drilling into a stud and not just drywall. I come back around to install my final base cabinet, and as you can see, there is a significant slope downward to this cabinet, and this is why we started in the corner where the high spot was, because we cannot reduce the height of our base cabinets, but we can increase the height if needed. I double check our levelness between our oven opening, and I also make sure that the faces of these cabinets align properly, so when we do have the countertops, they match up appropriately. We have a full height cabinet located right next to our fridge, but there wasn't one of these before, which is why there's an outlet and a light switch. The easiest way to accommodate this changeup is to actually just maneuver the light switch on the opposite side of the wall, which I do very carefully by cutting the old box out, making a hole on the opposite side and installing a new retrofit light box. As for our outlet, I'm just cutting a hole in the back of our cabinet, then scooting our cabinet up against that outlet and pulling it through the hole. And in all honesty, this is a perfect opportunity because of the fact that the client wants to place their coffee maker in this cabinet, which is why they need power. Before I secure the tall cabinet to the wall, I do fasten the upper cabinet that's gonna be placed above the fridge first. And once that's leveled and secured, I then fasten our tall cabinet to our wall making sure we have proper spacing for our large fridge that's gonna be going underneath our cabinet. At this point in time, I do wanna get a couple of our appliances out of my way before I install our island, which is why I cut a hole in the side of our sink cabinet in order to fit our hoses and electrical requirements for our dishwasher. I also carefully re-secure the gas line and electrical for the oven before sliding it back into place. And now it's finally time to work on our island. The island itself is just made up of three cabinets and we just stack them side by side by side. Now the one thing you really want to make sure of is that you have an equal spacing all the way down your aisleway. You need to account for the width of your appliances as well because you want to make sure you're able to get your appliances out once this island is permanently installed. I marked the exact locations where this cabinet is going to be placed and then bring in our half inch plywood and secure that to our subfloor. I set down our first cabinet, wiggle it in position, and bring over the second and third cabinets right after that. Once our cabinets are aligned, I still need to make sure that they're all perfectly level. And that's where our shims come into play yet again. And we were definitely in need of some because this floor is quite sloped in multiple directions. Once I had all three cabinets fully leveled out, I then secured them nicely with a number of fasteners, and again, making sure that I'm fastening the faces of our cabinets together, which does make a difference as you see the seam disappear. In order to stiffen the backside of our kitchen island, I do shim it up, clamp it down, and fasten it on the inside of the cabinet. Once all of our fasteners are in place, I remove my clamps and use my multi-tool to cut any of the excess shim. You want to make sure this island is somehow attached to the subfloor and therefore I pre-drill some holes and toenail, or in this case, toe screw, a couple screws in at the very bottom. 
At this point in time, we are done installing all of our cabinetry, so I go around and cut off any excess shims that don't belong. We are opting out of a dedicated range hood and going with a microwave hood combo kit. This actually is really nice because it's functional and it provides more countertop space, which goes a long way for this growing family. The microwave comes with a template and drill cut sheet, which makes it extremely easy to determine exactly where I need to place my screws, my fasteners, and of course, penetrations for the electrical in the upper cabinet as well as the venting in the back. Just make sure you read the instructions first before you install because there are multiple options to choose from based on how you want things to be vented. I install our wall mounting bracket at the appropriate height and have to get a little creative in order to get this large, heavy microwave up in place by myself while screwing it in from the top down. Just try and get a helping hand on this one, it'll make it a lot easier. It's now time to take care of some finishing touches on this project which starts with hardware cabinet handles. In order to make this drilling process extremely quick and efficient, I'm using this hardware template guide which gives me the exact pinpoint needed for 6 and 3 inch handles. Once my holes are drilled, I insert my screws that come with the kit and tighten them down on the handle. That easy and that quick. Just make sure you're drilling into the right hole on your template guide. Kind of important because you only get one shot at this. As for drawer units, I actually didn't have a template guide for this, so the easiest way I find doing it is just to determine exactly where the center point is on the drawer face, then taking a piece of tape, placing it on the handle, and poking holes through exactly where your screw locations are. That gives you exactly where those fasteners need to be placed, place that center point on the other center point on the drawer face, and drill. Well, I do double check my hole placements before I drill, but once that's taken care of, then drill and secure your handle in place. Just remember that you might actually have to have longer screws for these locations because it's going through the drawer face as well as the framework for the drawer itself. I proceed by fastening all of the handles throughout the entire kitchen, and just keep in mind that I do have three, six, and 12 inch handles for this entire set. And just like any materials or tools seen in this video, I'll make sure and leave a link in the description box below. With your cabinets, you may have the option for some drawer pullouts, and if you do, I highly recommend them because they're extremely functional and very easy to install. The way I do it is set up my laser level at exactly where I want the shelf height to be at, that way I know exactly what both sides need to be set at. Then slide it into place and you're good to go. With most kitchens, including this one, your shelves are just going to be supported with a shelf support pin like these. They're extremely easy to adjust and position each shelf at the exact location that you want. Just make sure all four of the pins are at the same height. You may need to finagle the shelf in there a bit in order to get the shelf in place with the pins already in place, but with a little wiggle and shimmy, you're able to get it done. Once all of our shelving is taken care of and in place, I can proceed to our paneling. Now, not all cabinetry is the same, and therefore you might not have to do this step, but with our cabinetry, we have these faux panels that actually fit on all the sides of our cabinets. In order to adhere these panels without any nail penetrations, I use this high strength contact adhesive spray by 3M. It's really easy to work with, and all you have to do is apply a heavy coat on both sides, let both sides dry to the point where you can actually touch it, and no residue is left on your hand. That's when you know the adhesive is ready for proper bond strength. I lean one side of the panel up against the outside corner of the cabinet, and slowly laying the panel down flat. Now you want to make sure this is picture perfect before you lay this panel down, because once this adheres, it's not coming off anytime soon. I do suggest applying some painter's tape on both sides to make sure that any overspray that does hit is easily removable because all you have to do is remove the tape. And if you're asking yourself why do we even need these, it's because during the installation as well as the transportation portion of this project, the sides of the cabinets may be dinged up during the process. This way we can guarantee that we have a perfect finish because these panels are protected through the entire course of the project and only installed once we're done with the cabinetry. For the base cabinets, I remove any excess toe kick with my multi-tool and then dry fit my panel first. That way I can then figure out exactly what I need to cut off at the very bottom in order to provide a perfect transition for our toe kick. I transcribe my marks from the back to the front of the panel and then use a circular saw and speed square to get as perfect a cut as possible. The same adhesive application process is done at this point by applying the adhesive on both this panel as well as the side of the cabinet. 
Once fully applied and properly dried out, I line up the side of the panel with the outside corner of our cabinet and also make sure that the alignment with the toe kick is exactly where I want it. You can use your hand to apply pressure, but I would suggest using a rubber roller to evenly distribute the weight across the entire panel. I do the same procedure to all the side panels that are actually visible, but the only thing that changes is at the kitchen island. The kitchen island actually is going to get some trim on the sides, and therefore I take my finished pin nailer and nail down one of the sides. Before I install the large back panel for our island, I do mark exactly where our legs come down because that's going to be the only area where I can nail to. I measure out the exact dimension needed for the height of this cabinet, but I actually add a half inch for the length of this panel, and you'll see momentarily why. After I have the entire panel cut and apply my contact adhesive spray, I position the panel as needed, but I do make sure it's overlapped on both sides of the cabinet. I do pin nail the perimeter of this panel as well for added support. Our cabinet system also comes with added toe kick paneling, which I just have to measure out and cut smoothly at a 90 degree angle. As for trim, our cabinets came with one inch by one quarter inch trim pieces. These pieces are placed on the floor as well as vertically wherever our cabinet meets the wall. However, on the floor pieces, I did want a bit of an eased edge, and therefore I do a 45 degree chamfer angle. That just gives this trim a bit of style and character, but remember to paint it before you install it because it's a lot easier to paint now than trying to get down close to the floor later. Luckily for me on this project, the one thing I didn't have to do was install the engineered hardwood flooring, but I do have a perfect engineered hardwood flooring video tutorial for you that I just did recently. I'll make sure and leave a link in the description box below and just wanted to make sure that was addressed before you thought we were skipping steps. After I have the horizontal trim piece taken care of on the side of our cabinet, I place a small vertical trim piece on the corner to cover up that raw edge of our panel. I then position and secure our toe kick with a couple pin nails and then we move on to our island. If you can remember, the back panel was slightly larger than needed, which is why I use this trim bit on my router which perfectly smooths out that entire edge. With the edges cleaned up, I can place my vertical trim on both sides and then proceed to my horizontal edging. You obviously don't have to use this type of edging on your project, but it's a really nice sleek look that I feel finishes off all these cabinets in a very nice professional way. With the base cabinets trimmed out and taken care of, we can proceed to our upper cabinets, and we're actually going to be installing crown molding over all of our upper cabinets. The trick with crown molding is to cut it at the appropriate angle as well as the right direction. Our saw is set at a 45 degree angle, but I flip our trim upside down and cut it that direction to get the proper direction. I know this seems counterintuitive, but in order to have the proper angle for our inside and outside corners, you have to flip our trim upside down. This might take a bit of practice to get the perfect angle that you're desired and looking for, but once you get the hang of it, it's fairly straightforward. In order to measure the correct length of each board, I place my tape measure at the bottom of each trim board and take my measurement from there. This is because we're taking the measurement off of our cabinet and that coincides nicely with our cabinet trim, obviously. And I suggest cutting your angled cuts first and then your straight cuts will make it a lot easier. I double check my trim first before nailing it in place and once I feel confident in the sizing, I can then nail it together. I find it's much easier to manage and nail right in front of you on the ground versus up in the air on a ladder. So when possible, do this ahead of time and then bring your piece of trim up and fit it snugly in place. Before installing, I did place a couple pieces of blue painter's tape at every single stud location where my joist framing is located, which means I'm actually nailing into something structural. Once all my crown molding is fully installed, there are a few miscellaneous vertical pieces that I have to put on the upper cabinets. Now you don't have to have these, but I feel they provide a nice professional look and feel in the end. And with that, this project is done, at least for part one.
This was one truly amazing transformation. And as you can see, this space feels completely different and what an amazing opportunity to completely transform this entire kitchen. This is gonna be a two part video which shows in detail how we actually get a perfect fit with kitchen countertops. And even if this kitchen isn't finished, it's still one beautiful, sexy beast. And as promised, Georgia Boot was the sponsor of this week's video, and they wanted to give the BYOT fam 20% off site-wide. All you have to do is type in BYOT. They were definitely well used on this project and saved my bacon multiple times.